Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Jonathan Lopez, and I'm many things in life. One being a Marine Corps veteran, the other being a dad. That's the, the most important role I have. So I started this podcast to interview dads and just discuss different topics with experts in, in different industries and really tackle everything from fitness and fun to faith and finance. Tune in, like and subscribe, and we look forward to having you every week. Welcome to Rad Dad Podcast. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Rad Dad Podcast. We have another guest on today, Luke Farrell from DTF Podcast, Dudes Talking Freedom, once again. Uh, so back-to-back conversations with uh, with the dudes over there. It's just we've been hitting on this, this key topic of community and, and why raising your kids in a great community means a lot, especially uh, in this day and age, being with all the chaos that we live around and live in and how important it is and, you know, Luke, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell the folks you know, what you do, who you are, kids, all that good stuff. Yeah, so I'm a father of three. I have two step kids, um, Avery and Nolan. Avery's 10, Nolan's eight, a boy and a girl, and then a biological daughter, Olivia, uh, Olivia Gray. We call her OG. And then one more on the way uh, come yeah, any September, minute. September, right? Next what? Next month? Yeah, just. Or any minute. We don't know. Just pretty much any yeah. minute, you know. I mean, everything's like, uh, you know, did I, I sneezed, you know, is, <laughs> do we need to go to labor and delivery? You know, anything, any little thing that happens, we're just freaking out. It's ready for this baby to come. We just did an ultrasound yesterday. Uh, so we're at 34 weeks and he's supposed to weigh, and it's a boy, and he's supposed to weigh 4.75 pounds. And he's weighing, and we took bets the night before, me and, this, and the kids and my wife. And I pulled out the six-pounder, you know, and we go in there, and he's six pounds, five ounces is what he's measuring. But my daughter, Olivia, she was measuring super small. And I don't know, they're, they're saying like three pounds, and I'm sure I'm butchering it, but it was way off. And she ended up being six pounds, one ounce. So I don't know. I don't put a ton of credence in there. Measurement techniques, but you know, yeah, it's the a best of, they got. yeah, a lot of stuff's a like guesstimation at that point. We're like, well, until they come out, we have no idea how much <laughs> they're going to weigh, how long they're going to be. We've got all this technology, but at the end of the day, it just matters that the kid's healthy. So, right, and you can extrapolate that to like, oh, how how old is the universe? You know, and like, <laughs> you know, how, how old is exactly. this baby? How big is this baby? And you know, I don't know. You could see, you know, in, over billions of years, maybe get pretty far off course you know i don't know <laughs> but who knows i don't know i don't have a you know astrophysicist degree or anything but uh i have uh, a no, business no, degree from oklahoma state yeah where i went off and did some uh financial services i was in the financial services industry yeah tell um, me more about that how you got into that industry and, and what drew you to it and what lessons have you learned that helped you as a father yeah so i wanted to be my dad was cpa um, and he's just wrapping up selling his practice right now. Um, he, he actually sold it and he's closing out the books, you know, done, done being a CPA. He's right? counted enough beans. Yeah. He's got enough beans for, for one lifetime. Right. And then, uh, so, you know, I was always drawn to the financial, uh, field or finance field. And I, I always knew that I wanted to help people. Um, and I, I always knew that I, I kind of got bored with things pretty easily, you know? So I wanted to be in an industry where, I had a, I was focusing on a whole lot of different things, and what better way than the stock market where you're focused on literally every possible company there is in the universe, right? So that's what got me interested in that field, and I always wanted to do uh, be a you know, be a stock trader, basically, you know, be an asset trader, equity trader, and I did really well in college on a stock trading game, and that kind of gave me the confidence to just boost myself into that industry. And it became, it's really difficult to get into the institutional side unless you know people or you're an Ivy Leaguer, which obviously Oklahoma State isn't, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> it's the Ivy League of Oklahoma, right? That's right, it is. <laughs> there you go. It is. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe there's another one. UCO may. may uh, yeah, and all the, all the institutional brokers that I've known, same thing. They, they all say the same thing. You have to know someone to get in or you have to go to an Ivy League school or your, your dad or your mother worked in the industry. More right. than likely, your your dad did because that's just the industry. Yeah, it's very male dominated world there, or it has been historically, and that's changing. Uh, so you know, started off as a customer service phone rep, and then went off and became a financial analyst with 
another company where I was a personal financial advisor. And that I, I ended up just trying to help anybody in any type of financial distress. And it didn't really matter like how much money I was going to make. I just wanted to help anybody, right? Like I can't turn you down. I know that you only have $25,000 in assets and I'm really looking for million dollar asset holders, you know, cause <laughs> looking for high wealth individuals only. Right. Like, you know, no, I'll help you out. And that's how you make money. But I was helping these people get out of debt uh, and helping them uh, with their budgets and stuff, you know, in order to get out of the credit card debt and put more money back towards retirement, you know. So I was really just taking a very personal uh, approach with every person I met, you know, and I'd take any, any skin I could put on the wall, I'm going to do it, right? So I don't know. I did really well at it, and I was raising tons of assets, but it just burned me up because my branch manager just wanted me to push the same products over and over, not necessarily what's best for the client, but what's best for the firm, right? So I got burned out with that. And then I went and negotiated some credit card debt for a while and played a little poker, a little online poker, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. It was like, so what you're saying is you're a numbers guy. Though. I'm a numbers guy for sure. I have my resume on monster.com and this company in Las Colinas, Texas hit me up and said, Hey, you want to come in for an interview? I'm like, yes, right now it's an institutional trading desk. Uh, this is the chance of a lifetime. I haven't even got any bites ever on any of my, you know, resumes with these companies. So I ran in there, I basically just went that afternoon. I came in there super excited and they gave me the job, you know, and Wait. I was a junior trader. I'm working with like three other guys and it's a very high testosterone environment. Like people were getting pissed off and taking their chairs and throwing them on the ground, their, their keyboards and banging them on their desks. I had an institutional broker tell me this one time that the Wolf of Wall Street is true. Yeah. They're like, if you've seen the movie, they're like, that crap actually happens. They're yeah. Like, they're just like, you know, the way they the way they spend money, the way they talk, the way they react to deals falling through or closing deals. They're like, all that is true. Like, it's, it's not an exaggeration of how that industry is. It isn't. I mean, the, the people on Wolf of Wall Street are probably a little <laughs> bit more, uh, a little prettier. Right. And they sensationalize it a little bit. But like, for the most part, yeah, it, it's pretty true. I mean, I've watched... One of my managers take a nine iron to the, you know, the sheetrock, you know, just whack it, you know, and I was like, oh, whoa, goodness. this is crazy, you know, and it's just kind of fun. I, I don't know. I just react to it. I don't really like that kind of thing. It's just kind of funny to me. Everything's funny to me. You said you had like 13 monitors, right? Yeah. So after a while, after I started moving up the ladder, you know, I ended up, um, the other traders basically left or got let go. And all the responsibility ended up falling on me. And yeah, uh, I was beta testing out a uh, OMS platform that uh, the, the largest market maker on the street, I guess I can't say names necessarily, but like the largest market maker on the street at the time was beta testing their uh, direct access platform, direct trading access platform. Okay. So I was, I was beta testing that to see if there's any glitches or, you know, any, any suggestions that I can tell the tech team to, hey, make this tweak here or make this tweak there. And then I was paying, you know, like $2,500 a month for my Bloomberg terminal and like $1,500 a month for my Thompson Reuters terminal. And we kept those things on separate machines, right? So I had all these separate machines and all these separate programs and a ton of different um, – spreadsheets where I was tying in data and building custom indexes basically in order to arbitrage certain situations. So I'd see some pricing discrepancies between two different assets that were uh, correlated to the same pricing mechanism, but they were different um, basically financial products, right? So when sure. those two financial products had a wide gap in pricing uh, inefficiency, we would exploit that. Right. So you'd short one and you'd go long the other one and wait until those that gap closed and then you'd unwind the position, essentially. So I did a lot of that, a lot of cash flow analysis uh, where I'm just tying data into spreadsheets on Excel and, you know, did that. Did forever. you have kids when you were doing all that? No, I no. didn't. You know, and I was out of shape and I would get to the office, you know, and I could wear basically shorts and a T-shirt to the office. You know, and eventually I was the branch manager and I managed the branch. I mean, what you're describing reminds me a lot of the show Billions. Yeah. 
And I, I quit watching, I think after season two, but an institutional broker friend of mine was like, dude, that's all BS. Yeah. He's like, we don't short that much. He's yeah. like, it, it, almost every five minutes in that show, they talk about shorting a stock and shorting a stock and shorting a stock. He's like, it doesn't happen that often. And, and he was basically giving me the breakdown that you just gave me from an analysis standpoint of, hey, we're showing that there is a price difference on two different mechanisms, and then we're going to take advantage of that. He's right. just like, it takes a lot of work to get that. He's like, so, yes, I understand it's a show. I understand that they have to get people to watch. He's like, but at one point, uh, he goes, I just had to turn it off. Right. And after he told me that, every time I watched the show, I was like, oh, they're shorting another stock. They're doing this. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Like, this is ridiculous. Well, it's kind of like <laughs> the most risky thing you can do, right? A full naked short is what they call that, you know, because, can, you know, uh, a stock could actually go as, you know, to infinity and beyond, Right. So there's literally nothing stopping you. You have an unlimited amount of loss potential risk, right? Sure. Loss risk. So that's really kind of what uh, the risk models aren't really friendly to a na fully on naked short. And there's situations where companies will just shoot up to become like these huge, this huge bubble, like Volkswagen, for example. Back in, I don't know, I guess it's maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, um, it there was a huge short interest out on it and everybody started to cover and it drove the price like way sky high where it's the biggest company in the world, you know? And like, it was way overvalued clear that, you know, you should short it, but like it could still double from here. You know, you don't really know. I mean, it could literally go to infinity and beyond. So a lot of people shy away from that. So out of all the complex things you just said, like how would you explain that to your kids? Like, what did I, what did dad used to do? How do I explain that? In like simple terms, I always tell people I'm an overeducated idiot. So I talk in metaphors and I need simplistic terms because at the end of the day, I'm still just an idiot. Right. So how would you explain that to your kids? Well, I think the way you would is essentially <clears throat> for every high, there's a low, right? And don't get too, it's great to enjoy the good times, but know that, you know, there's going to be some hard work put, put, put in for that good time. And then the flip side to that is that when things get bad, you know, know that, you know, things are going to get better, you know? So it's all just an algorithm. It's the algorithm of life, right? Yeah. And we're all on our own personal experience or journey. And you're only going to get out of your life what you put into your life. So it's just basically input value, future value, present value of money. So, I mean, you can pretty much extrapolate that, you know, linear rep, you know, path to the path of life, really, you know? So that's, that's probably how I'd No, I get that. It. it makes sense to me. Like I said, I have several friends that are in the investment industry and the financial industry, period. Yeah. And sometimes they talk over my head. And yeah. I'm like, I have no idea what the hell you're saying right now, but I just nod and, oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to come to you for advice. Just don't talk your talk and just let me know where I should invest my money at. And I, I've understood that over the years, that an investment is a long-term strategy. It's not a short-term strategy. And you, you should know what you're doing. Yeah. Because if you don't and you don't have knowledge, you don't read into it, then it's just gambling. Yeah. And while I do love a good craps game, <laughs> craps is still numbers. And it, it's, it's hedging your bet on what the dice are going to put out there, what they're totaling up to. So... I had a good friend of mine teach me how to play craps. I don't play anything else at a casino. Oh, casino night or casino. I'm like, all right, I'm, I know numbers. I know these numbers. Whereas yeah. all the other stuff, it's still a gamble. It's still just a bet. Yeah. And I feel like craps is a, a little bit more math. And you're hedging your bet. It's still betting, but you're hedging your bet based off of the, the probability and the risk that's on, on the board. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, it's um, there's a – the the over to the casino right like craps is still pretty much a 50 50 coin flip right yeah. like the the odds are pretty good for them but like where craps really starts to incentivize you know some of the more savvy players is that you know you can reduce those odds you know you can make the odds more in your favor yeah with all the side bets right knowing the game can help you actually achieve a better outcome and you can do that with blackjack and you you can do that 
pretty much with anything, any game of chance. And the stock market is certainly gambling. You know, you, you can't take take out the gambling of it really at all. Even heck, as a school teacher, you can't even take the gambling out of it. You know, I mean, you could get things can happen anywhere. You know, and oh, that was, absolutely. That was kind of my idea of like, hey, why not just take a riskier, you know, a per- more riskier perceived profession professional path because I really think that like there's just risk everywhere, you know, and it's all pretty much determined off macros. Even Peter Lynch, that was his big philosophy is like 90% of your return comes off, uh, you know, your macro situation. So like bigger things that are happening in the economy, like interest rates, you know? Sure. I I mean, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about numbers. I'm a numbers guy as well. I, I work in, the financial services industry under the the insurance area okay so it's just risk assessment and i emphasize to my son all the time how important math is and one thing i always say especially within my business is people lie numbers don't yeah show me the numbers so if i can see how you came up with your numbers and they match up okay great that's that's a great decision let's let's move forward and and go that way yeah and I've, i've come across individuals that I do business with uh, on the on the broker side and their numbers don't match up to what we have and I'm trying to explain our value proposition and well we're saving your client two hundred thousand dollars but you polled the employees and they want to go a different route are we making a financial decision here or or are we just gambling at that point Uh, is this a democracy or constitutional republic yeah exactly (laughs) so it's it's a difference of you know what their definition of it is and what they're looking to accomplish. But at the end of the day, I still look at it as finances and you're, you're making a, a financial decision since a lot of these, not a lot, all employers are, are fiscally responsible to their employees for their health plan. Right. So I don't understand how they make the decisions that they make sometimes, but you know, it's one thing I try to emphasize to my son is look at the numbers and if it makes sense, go with your gut. Yeah. And if it doesn't make sense, well, just walk away from it. Yeah, it's it's fine. I've I've walked away from buying cars before because the numbers didn't make sense to me. Um, you know, d- different situations in life, and being that that's how I look at the world, and I, I, that's my perspective. It's how I looked at the pandemic. Yeah, I looked at my survivability rate if I contracted the virus, it was like, well, 99.87% says I'll be all right. Yeah. And I thought about my medical history. I thought about my, my family history. And I was like, I I work, I exercise five, six days a week. I watch what I eat. I I take vitamins. I get outside. I'm, I'm good. I don't, I don't really care about what's going on out there. Right. And it, it was funny and it's still happening today. I saw it, gosh, two days ago, I think, uh, one of the programs on mainstream media was was talking about children being 30% unhealthier or obese than their parents. Oh, yeah. Were at the same time, you know, in their childhood. And they tried to blame it on climate change. Right. And I was like, last time I knew uh, the, the temperature outside doesn't affect my BMI. Right. And it doesn't affect how healthy I am and what I eat. And how much I exercise. Uh, I mean, it could influence how much you exercise if you exercise outside. But there's gyms inside all the time. So it, it was just a weird kind of correlation that they drew from some of the data. And it's just that's their piece that they're trying to go to and they're trying to concentrate on. And let's look at the shiny thing over here when this is really going on over here. And it's, it's no secret that children consume more sugar now than ever. And there's sugar in everything. Yeah. And it's one thing I try to teach my son within his nutrition is now you can't have that. He, like he wanted a snack the other day before hockey tryouts. And he grabbed a Twix ice cream out of the fr- freezer. Mm. And I was like, no, Those are good. No, <laughs> <laughs> they are good. I've had I've had I've had them before. Yeah. I was like, that's not a great that's not a good choice. Right. I was like, yes, you need simple sugars for the activity that you're going to do. But that's got way too many in, in there. Mm-hmm. And you could make a, a smarter decision. You can make a smarter choice. So it's those little choices at home that the, the kids will remember on, hey, I remember at one time I wanted ice cream before practice. And dad said no. Yeah. And that's how I grew up. 
is, you know, I grew up playing baseball out in the Texas heat. Yeah. So it was, you needed to be hydrated. And this was back in the day when they were still recommending salt tablets. Oh yeah. My dad would give me salt tablets and I'd play catcher. I'd be okay. And data came out later saying that you should do the opposite of that. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, oh, okay. So, but I look at it as it's a lesson learned and, and we were able to, to take that data and look at it and make a different decision and say, okay, maybe I shouldn't take salt tablets anymore yeah. and, and move on. And it's trying to teach those small things to your children that will help reduce that 30% more obesity rate from children. When, so when they have children, it's lesser, it's less than that. Right. It's quantum theory, right? Like uh, whenever you, we're all quantum beings, right? So when you start to, uh, when you look at a quantum being and start recording what's going on with that quantum being, that quantum being behaves differently, right? So basically what you're saying is to log the data, right? Figure out what's going on and what, why it's happening, log the day, data and analyze the data and make different decisions as a result of uh, the data analysis, right? Sure. So, yeah. Uh, I think that's great. I think that the other thing uh, that has changed children, children's behavior essentially, is technology, right? Like it's so much more comfortable. Our day-to-day -day life is so much more comfortable. It's just a world full of, you know, marshmallows and root beer streams and lollipop trees, right? Like everywhere. <laughs> so people are so comfortable that when they go outside, you know, there's an arbitrage there, right? Like yeah. it's really, it's, it's, 68 degrees in here, you know, there's a nice cool fan, I'm playing my Xbox, I'm eating my Twix. But then I go outside and it's a, it feels like 110. But when I was a kid, you know, it was like 76 inside, 78, you know, and I'm just playing the Nintendo, right? And I'm just eating chips. <laughs> so it's just a yeah. little bit harder. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit harder. There's more technology that keeps us comfortable. Yeah. And I, I tell people that's part of the reason I still work out is I want to be uncomfortable. Yeah. I want to try something that I suck at, which is why I, you know, I have a, an obsessive personality. Yeah. And I've jumped into ice hockey lately. I learned how to skate 10 months ago. No and kidding. Now, yeah, now I play in a league. Awesome. And I played in the tournament. And I'm just like, I hate sucking at things. Yeah. But I have an obsessive personality where I want to do it. And I want to do stuff that I suck at because it, not only is it going to challenge me mentally and physically, but it's also going to build new neuro pathways and yeah. make my brain more more plastic. So it's it's challenging me and keeping me young in that aspect. And it's a hell of a workout. Yeah. And when you tell people you play ice hockey in Texas, they just look at you like you're you're a different <laughs> person, aren't you? Like, yeah, I'm smarter than all of you. Yeah. I, I say that because it's a hundred degrees out during the summer, hundred plus. And all these parents are at the soccer fields mm -hmm. and baseball fields, and I'm in a 40 degree arena. Yeah. With my son that plays ice hockey, or I'm on the ice. And I'm just like, what else could you ask for? <laughs> it's, it's cold in here. Yeah. You want a snow cone on a high day? Hell yeah, I do. Yeah. You know, exactly. Squirrels are icing their nuts, right? Like, <laughs> it's great. So, last episode we had Vince on, we, he talked about how you guys started the podcast during the pandemic and, and why it was important. And I, I feel like it helps people stay sane. And I, I had one location I worked at during the pandemic since I was sent home from my office and then never returned back to office. Yeah. And it kept me sane to have that personal interaction with people fellowship, and that connection, yeah. that fellowship. And that's what I talk about all the time is it's what's missing in society right now. You can't disagree on anything and people walk away and you lose friendships. And the, the most recent Rogan podcast, he had Seth Dillon on from Babylon B. Yeah. And they they had a great conversation about abortion. Yeah. And they disagreed. And both of them after the the conversation ended were Isn't this so nice? We can have a conversation about a a very interesting topic yeah. and a very flammable topic. And we can disagree and then still be polite to each other and be nice. And I, I think Rogan just said, like, just, just don't be an asshole. Yeah. It, like, there needs to be less assholes in the world. And if you're just a nice person, that's who you are at the end of the day, it's going to go so much further. And he said, that's what I try to teach my children is yeah. just don't, don't be an asshole. Be nice to people. 
treat them like you would treat them in person. And, you know, they, they discussed the, the veil that people have behind social media. Mm-hmm. Like, would you, would you say that to that person's face? Yeah, it's their safe space. Right? No. Well, then don't say it on social media. Don't, don't type it in there. I, I can't remember the last interaction I had on social media with another person I didn't know. Yeah. Where we were on opposite sides of the spectrum. We we were arguing, not discussing something. And I, I can't remember the last time that happened because I stay away from that stuff. I know people feel safer uh, since they're, you know, keyboard warriors and they're mm-hmm. safe behind their screen. They never have to see me. Right. Because some of the stuff that those people say on social media will get you punched in the face. Yeah. Or at least when I grew up, it yeah. would get you punched in the face. Salt in the tablets and yeah. bloody noses, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about, you know, your experience with starting it, how you started within the community. By the way, I love, love Winsong Ranch, love the community. Uh, you're actually a third resident that I've had on for Winsong Ranch. Oh, yeah. And it's just a great area. I understand why people choose it, and, and it's very close, and it's it's a little kickback to Americana is how I look at it. 100%, yeah. You know, I mean, when I grew up, I grew up uh, on a street with, um, you know, all kinds of boys you know and we all hung out and played backyard everything together and as i grew i was like there's no way that i'm ever gonna you know find a community like that again but you know maybe i can get to a fraction of a community but then we stumbled upon winsong ranch three years ago up in prosper texas and it's everything that was and more you know i mean it's just so much community everybody wants to, and and you really the COVID experience really kind of helped, you know, throw, throw a little kerosene on that tire fire of a community, (laughs) you know, and, um, I don't know. It's just fantastic. You know I mean? We hang out together. There's a group of us that go on vacations together, you know? So, uh, we know that everybody has each other's back. So we absolutely love that. And all the dads, uh, you know, one of kind of like the, the, cornerstone roles of a dad period is to get their children out of their comfort zone. Right. Yeah. I I think that's so important. Right. And that's that's what they're doing on social media is staying in their safe space. They don't want to get out of their comfort zones and they're hiding behind, you know, their keyboards. Right. So I think that it's awesome that you got your kid out there playing hockey, you know, and doing anything that's making them feel uncomfortable, you know. So I think that's super important. And I think that, you know, a little bit of the Dudes Talking Freedom podcast has to do with that as well. You know, I mean, we're talking about some uncomfortable topics, you know, and kind of my role on in life really is just to kind of keep things funny. Right. And that's my goal is just try and laugh about everything, you know, make a joke about everything. And sometimes my jokes, you know, they, they probably cross the line, you know, here and there. But, you know, <laughs> a I mean, good joke will cross the line. That's right. You got to walk the line. You know, I mean, there's no fun. It's no fun right down the middle. You know, I mean, you got to be out there in the Six Sigma events. Right. You know, yeah. it's just like, let's hang out at the end of the bell curve, right? So, yeah, that's where, you know, we're, what we're talking about and what we're discussing uh, on Dudes Talking Freedom is all the stuff that the mainstream media isn't talking about. And the distribution of the bell curve is really, you know, centric, and it's all just the same narrative over and over and over again. In fact, there's a company called Shepherd Broadcasting Corporation, which owns most of the local TV uh, news stations and there's real I've seen I've seen all these clips where they just run the same same news anchor or same same night different news anchors saying the exact same things you know the exact same sure. lines verbatim all across the country so it's just messaging that's coming from a corporation called Shepherd Broadcasting Corporation right so sure I, I don't even watch Fox News anymore yeah. And as as a conservative, people just automatically say, oh, well, you watch Fox News or you watch OAN, Newsmax. They never say CNN, but it's just like I don't I don't watch any of those. I actually get my news from Burning Points, with yeah. Crystal and Sager, because they're as independent as it comes. Yeah. I mean, you have to pay for their premium subscription to get zero ads. And I love that. And I do that. But to, to me, I get the, the core of the situation on what happened. I don't get a spin. I, I don't get the left spin. I don't get the right spin. I, I get what it is truly as, as the news and journalism. Yeah. 
And I love that. And they bring other independent journalists onto their show to discuss topics. And you can tell <clears throat> that Crystal and Sagar lean a certain way, right. but they're not spinning it a certain way to get you to think, oh, well, you know, Donald Trump is evil and Joe Biden's doing a great job. Right. Or, you know, vice versa. Joe Biden's an idiot. And Trump did a great job. And, you know, I don't agree 100 percent with with any of them, right. with, with Biden, with Trump, with with the Republicans, with the Democrats. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, both parties are corrupt. Yeah. And they, they just lean towards what's going to make them money, what's going to make their close, tight knit network money as well. And that's what you have to look out for is what's going on, what's being spun and trying to, to raise a kid during this environment when you're you're hearing people say stuff right. and you, you pick up on it. And I at one point, gosh, this is years ago, like two years ago, I think during a pandemic. We were at a pool party and my son had mentioned to one of the guests at my aunt and uncle's house that he, oh, I don't like the police. Mm. And the, the guest <clears throat> knew me and it was like, I don't think your dad <laughs> would agree with that statement. Yeah. And he's like, why do you say that? Oh, I heard some kids at school saying it. And, you know, my teacher didn't say anything a about lot of it. So I think she agrees with it. I walk out back back out to the pool and he's like ask your son what he just said i was like what'd you say he's like oh, i didn't like the police i was like oh really well you give him a high five every time we go to a stars game like you hmm. you say hi to hi to them you're always friendly to the police like how do you not like them well i don't know and it was it was a back it was a quick backtrack because he yeah. knew it wasn't the values that he had been taught it's just what he had overheard at school and you know there's there's, you know, a, a lot of that going on right now with, hey, I heard this at school. Maybe that's true. Maybe. And it's I always say, you know, people say education starts at home. Oh, yeah. It does from a core educational standpoint. And, and then we also entrust that to to the teachers. And let's we can talk about that topic if we want the teachers and that, and that level. And and I, I see it happening across the U.S., not in Texas, not in my son's school district. I haven't seen it. Right. But so, some of the the different things that make you scratch your head and say, something's wrong with that individual. It's not teachers overall. Something's wrong with that one individual. Yes. Just like the same situation with George, George Floyd. There was, there was an issue with that one police officer, not all of them. And that's what I had to drive home to my son during that situation. Was, there are some some issues there are some bad apples out there in yeah. every profession i mean we we talked about wolf of wall street earlier huge bad apple yeah dude's out of jail now making millions of dollars again yep but it's just showing people how he he was basically showing people more of his charismatic side and here's how to transition that into sales and it's just it, it's things that we have to worry about now which is like my ton, my son's not allowed on tiktok he, you know, watches minimal YouTube at my place. It's always YouTube kids. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't want to have to tackle all those influences, but I know I already have to tackle influences from your peers at school yeah. and stuff that you're saying and you're doing because there's things you see at home that you're like, you didn't learn that here. Yeah. Where'd you learn that from? Yeah. Yeah. It's important to have that ability to redirect, right? Like, being put out of your comfort zone, it'll it'll allow you to see a different side of things and maybe kind of the inequity of the situation, right? So when you're exposed to something really extreme, you know, you can come back and take a step back and realize that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. And it's not necessarily this extremist viewpoint that's that's occurring with uh, with your son's, you know, supposed, you know, thoughts on the police police in the world right like all the police not just that one policeman right yeah, plus at the time i think he was six so yeah a kid's opinion at the age of six well, that's how powerful marketing is right <laughs> marketing is a really powerful tool right super oh, powerful. absolutely so they can mold people and make people be whatever they want but the thing is is when they get too sensationalized and they are right now 
Like these ideologies that are being thrown out there are just very extreme. They're getting more and more extreme, you know. It started off with the razors, you know. You had one razor blade, and then you had two razor blades per razor, and then three and four and five, you know. And you, now you got Mach 7 razor blades going across your face <laughs> just to give yourself a, you know, a shave. <clears throat> so, I mean, it's just more and more extreme. So people can re- – people – see that as very blatantly obvious, the more and more extreme things get, or a larger percent of the population can, right? And sure, there's going to be some people that are just like all in, I can get as extreme as you want to get, I'm fine. But like, you know, the large majority of the population, I'd say an ever-growing percentage of the population, uh, has pushback on the more and more and ever extreme uh, stances that are being thrown out there into, you know, the metaverse in, in the world, right? So, yeah, and I think again, it goes back to that lack of interaction with people. Yeah, you don't have that human connection anymore. So your your children are influenced by the people they're around, and you know you're not there as a father or a mother to help really emphasize those core values, and you don't have people around you to to do that. And one thing Vince said on the last episode was, you know, I was convinced on the community when we first went to a Super Bowl party and I didn't really worry about who my kids were around. Yeah. And he's like, now getting to know the people we live around better, I know that they're going to be treated like their own, like their own kids when I go, when they go over to Luke's house Yeah, or they go over to Brett and Jess's house. Like they're going to be taken care of from a a basic needs standpoint, but they're also going to be disciplined. Mm Mm-hmm. Like they would at home, like, hey, I don't like just just like that individual did with my son. I don't think your dad would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. I didn't agree with that. So it it goes back to the that connection and yeah, it takes a village, right? Yeah, like, it, ta- it literally takes a village to raise your kids. I think it's more important now more than ever mm-hmm. since there are so many influences on their life outside of the community, outside of the household, and it, it really it really matters now. And, and I think I, we're, I'm blessed to live in a great neighborhood. You are to have a great school system. So I, I don't have to worry about a lot of stuff with school, especially when there's other parents that are involved from the PTA. Uh, now I think they call my son's like dad group, the Maverick Men. Yeah. Of course, you know, Top Gun came out and oh, they yeah. had to redesign it. And they just <laughs> call it Maverick Men. And I'm like, all right, guys, we're going off. To, are we are we going to get uh, flight suits as sure. well and patrol the the school in flight suits? Hey, like, that sounds like a good I idea. Mean, yeah, I, keep it fun. I, I probably wouldn't say no to that. <laughs> I mean, I have a, a shirt that says "Hot Dad Summer" right now. If you yeah. can see it, I love it. So yeah. obviously, I'm a fun guy. Like I like to joke around. I like to have fun. I you know love a good theme party. I love to dress up and have a good time. So. I pass that on to my son, and anytime there's a theme at school, whether it be 100 days of school and he's got to be you know, dressed old or mm-hmm. they allow Halloween costumes, like we have fun with it. Yeah. And I know it's, it's not going to be anything that gets him in trouble at school. It's going to have fun. But I, we're blessed to live in communities and go to school districts like that. Yeah. And I know not everybody has that opportunity to, to do that. And I was sharing with a friend last week or a couple of weeks ago. I'm extremely concerned right now, being that we're in a recession, that it's going to hit people really hard. And it hasn't gotten there yet because we live in Texas and it's still booming down here and our economy is great. Yeah. But I, I see it in six months when those rate hikes really hit, the you know, Inflation Reduction Act really starts to come in where we just spent more money. Well, yeah, another 700, 750 billion. Yeah, 750 right? billion that we spent and it's... It's not even going to reduce inflation. No. So, you know, costs continue to go up and continue to go up. And what I've tried to, to use during this situation of, of being in the recession and knowing that I'm, I'm financially prepared for it is, you know, showing my son that other people are, are not prepared for it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, let, let's not gloat. Let's not talk about a whole bunch of stuff that we're doing in, in a an egotistical way and it's hey some some people have things that you know others don't we're in that situation so let's not flaunt it Let, let's not act like we're we're higher than them and like i said we live in a good neighborhood so we don't really have to to worry a lot about that within the school district. but there's still a continuum of wealth right yeah, even in your neighborhood yeah, so 100%. there's always going to be somebody that has a shinier toy than you 
you know, and the, you're probably going to have a shinier toy than a lot of other people too. Well, and what I've tried to do lately in the past couple of months is I cut back on the stuff that I buy him. Like, no, nah, you don't need any more toys. Yeah. You, you, you have a Nintendo switch. You don't need another toy. Yeah. You have a, you know, bubble hockey, you have a backyard, you have this, like, no, we're not going to go to Andretti this weekend. We're not <laughs> going to go to Dave and Buster. Like let's, let's stop spending money. Like we have an unlimited amount of it. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like that's teaching him to live within a budget and showing him, Hey, we just don't spend money. Like, it's going out of style because, you know, there's there's things that you have to be prepared for in life. And a recession is definitely one of them. Yeah. I mean, Amer- American ingenuity was born out of, you know, a rural sense of community, essentially, where people were just, for lack of a better term, bored. You know, and these kids, they need to be bored in order to get creative, you know. And if they get super, if they get bored enough, they'll find something fun to do. And that's where they need to be put, you know. And we can't just entertain them 24-7. And just keep them in that root beer stream and licking lollipop trees all the time, right? So Yeah, I mean, it's like the old saying goes, you know, good times create soft men, right. soft men create bad times, bad times create strong men. Yeah. So it's coming out of that uncomfortableness and that boredom where you know, a, a lot of the greats were born. I mean, the Industrial Revolution came out of the Great Depression. Right. And it was, okay, we need to do something to turn this around. We're in a depression. Yeah. So what do we do? I mean, there are a lot of other variables that influenced the Industrial Revolution and, and us coming out of, of the, uh, the depression. And it's, it's things like that, that that change the world. And there's since we're so advanced now, I think there's, unfortunately, it has to be a deeper depression to get us to re-innovate that way. Higher highs and, come and back lower on, lows, right? Yeah, and come back out on top. And it, I, don't, I don't know how we do that in, in our divide right now of being just two sides of the spectrum and not meeting in the middle and compromising and discussing topics anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think that ultimately you just have to focus on yourself, right? And do the best that you can be the best dad that you can be. Right. And if that means budgeting and and not spending every dollar you have just because you had a good month, then that's what it is, you know? And Hey, let's not go blow all our money at Dave and Buster's and let's not go buy every lotto ticket just because the lottery is over a billion dollars again. You know, I mean, you just kind of have to tether yourself and tether the children's expectations because otherwise, they will take, 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 take until it is all gone. I mean, they're just a bunch of rats, these children. <laughs> you know? I mean, they'll eat you out of house and home, literally. So, And I, in my head, I just played back what I said. And uh, the Industrial Revolution came before the Great Depression, but it also helped get us into the Depression with how much money we were making, how much money we were spending. And then the stock market tanked. And, right, and then the technological revolution. Yeah. Right? And, and it's another revolution, right? I mean, it, doesn't matter that you said industrial or whatever you said, right? Like, that's what happens, regardless of if your, you know, timeline's correct, your chronology is correct. But, you know, you, the overall theme of what you said is absolutely correct, you know? And it has been for millennia, you know, over and over since the beginning of time, really, right? Oh, I mean, civil, civilization is just the ebb and flow. Like you said, there's, there's those high peaks and those really deep valleys, and it goes like this for a good majority of it and stays pretty stagnant. But it's, I mean, that's life. And that's, that's what I try to teach my kid is you're going to have ups, you're going to have downs. And sometimes your downs feel like the, the lowest of the low. Uh, yeah. But the worst thing that happened to you today is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Yeah. But it, that, so that means you can change it. You can, you can get better. And it's always going to be the worst thing. It's just how you react to that worst thing and really how you, how you continue to just push through and teach that to other people as well. Because we, we keep going back to that community and that human connection. That's more valuable now more than anything. Mm-hmm. Like if I lost my job today, I could more than likely have a job next week because of all the friends that I have. Yeah. And we've created a close bond and, and what that, is, you know, it's just, hey, I know you, I know you as a person. Yes, I will recommend you to my company or another company that I know. I will start asking around for you. Mm. And that's the value of a, of a network. But at the end of the day, all the network is is a community. Mm-hmm. 
and it's taking care of the individual. Like you said earlier, it takes, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village, period, yeah. for society to run. And it's great that I still see pockets of that in DFW. And it's, you know, it, it bleeds out into other pockets of DFW and in the U.S. Yeah. Of here's how we do it. Yes, it works. You may not uh, agree with certain aspects of it, but it, it's tried and true. If you want to tweak something, tweak it. But this is what's worked for us. This is why we like it. And it's, I, I've started to dive into more of your episodes. I, I listened to the most recent one and the one before that. And I just see a, a continuous theme outside of, you know, yes, you're joking, you're having fun, you're saying stuff that, that may be you know, a little inflammatory to some people, but it's, it's in good faith and you're trying to have a conversation. Mm-hmm. And you may not always agree on the podcast together because there's four of you guys, but at the end of the day, you're still going to walk away and you're going to be friends. Oh, yeah, friends and neighbors. So. And neighbors. And you, you know, that's, that's one thing you, you can't get rid of is, is your neighbor. You have to move if you want to do that. Mm-hmm. Or burn their house down. <laughs> I'm not, you know, not con- advocating for that. Yeah. I'm not right advocating that for <laughs> at all. So it, it's just it's different things like that that I think too time too many times we're complicating things. Yeah, and it, it's as simple as having a conversation, and it's what I it's what I constantly try to get to my son about. Like, hey, let's have a conversation. Let's talk about this. Yeah, I don't want to yell at you. Yeah, but when you repeatedly repeatedly do not do stuff that I told you to do or that I've taught you to do, yeah, it makes me upset and I want to yell. But I'd rather just talk about it. So let's talk about it. Yeah, you can get a lot further with uh, open dialogue and communication, you know. And 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 when you take the wrong turn because you have tweaked something, even in societies, you see it, you know, like I don't know, maybe a little more on the West Coast, you know, or maybe sure. more in liberal cities, we start to see some of these tweaks that are just not really working out for them and that's just instant feedback and people push back on that you know and people are changing and that's what the red wave is all about right like it's just the blue wave went too far you know and now it's going to come back to the red wave and probably go back to the blue wave again you know so it's just yeah it's it's politics that's what's happened throughout our whole history as a nation and you know one thing that I, I think about with, with that is, again, I try to draw correlations to, to being a dad. And there, mm. there are a lot of politicians that are dads. I was thinking about this the other night. Oh, yeah. I was like, all right, the past three presidents, like, who are they as a dad? Like, what, how, what would be my assessment of it? And it, it's evident in their children a, a lot. And, you know, yes, there are some variables that, that are outliers as far as like the finances behind it yeah especially with with trump's kids uh but you look at joe biden and and you know with hunter what he deals with the hunter and everything Mm. hunter's done and his protection of him and i'm like was he really there as a dad like maybe that's why he has so many issues as, as an adult now and he has issues with his children and he's not stable is because you weren't there for him as a father yeah and, you know, I, I can't correlate that and say, oh, well, you know, Trump's children are so successful and that, you know, because he was there for them. When you have wealth like he does, you have people to take care of your job for you. Like, yeah. Yes. You're busy running a billion dollar corporation and he was busy on on TV doing The Apprentice. But at, at the end of the day, you're, you're still there. And one thing I do know about Donald Trump is if you're lost in a lobby in New York, he'll tell you where the lobby's at. Yeah. That at least. <laughs> yes, he will. He'll tell you where it is. If you didn't get that Home Alone 2 reference, people, you're a little too young for this. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but then I think back at, at Obama, President Obama, and how involved he was with his daughters. Yeah. And it's because he didn't have a father himself. Yeah. So it's really trying to – trying to. I always say, you know, if you know how good of a father someone is, you almost know how good of a person they are. Yeah. And whether they neglect their children or they're, they're overly involved with their children, it says a lot about their character. And it's one thing that, that doesn't exist anymore is, is that involvement from a, a father standpoint. And one of the things I try to hit hard on is how important that is at home yeah. and what it means. I mean, we, we know the statistic that you know, children without a father at home are five times as likely to end up in prison. Mm-hmm. That should scare people. Yeah. Tremendously. It should scare every single man out there. Like, hey, I got to be a good dad. 
at the end of the day, I may be shitty at my job. I may get crap pay. I'm going to work my butt off to, to make more money, but to be there for my kid because it means more. Because the ramifications of not being there are you know, so much higher than if I, if I were just to be there. I mean, five times higher for your kid to be in prison. Not, no one wants to visit it their kid in prison. It resonates for generations and throughout society, right? Yeah, like I mean, you said, it, it, it's, it's a domino effect. It affects... That your ch- your child's child and that ch- child after that to build to build back up from after that deficit. I thought you were gonna say build back better. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I thought they were already doing that. Right? Yeah, it's already happening. <laughs> build back better, 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 <laughs> better, better, better. So it's easy to do it when your dad say you you have a great dad. I think that children end up taking that for granted, you know. And when you're having when you have all the money in the world. Uh, children have this tendency to take it for granted. And people have this natural tendency to take these things for granted. So basically, you have to always be tethering yourself, always maintain discipline, and just drive home that importance of good father, being a good father, and fiscal responsibility, you know, and, and you know, physical conditioning, and, and across every facet of life, essentially is don't get don't let your head get so big that you float away, right? So you just have to maintain and be grounded and keep your eye on the prize and never quit, right? So I think that's Yeah, I, I was I was talking to my ex-wife about this last week with our son and he was at hockey tryouts and he's so confident He's like, oh, I'm the best skater, I'm the best hockey player. Like, I'll be on the best team. Yeah, yeah. And my ex-wife and I look at each other. We're like, that's cockiness. Yeah. When you lack the actual ability, it, that confidence turns into cockiness. So yeah. let's concentrate on the basics. Let's get you better. And then that'll be confidence. It will no longer be cockiness. And like you said, that ego gets in the way a lot. And I think... You know, I've, I've seen him watch YouTube videos where that's what the kids are saying. Like, I'm the best at this. I'm the best at that. Yeah, but there's a lot of work that goes into that. Yeah. You need to get your ass kicked. You know? yeah, like you need to go sit in the penalty box for a while and figure out you know, how, just how good you are. Right? Yeah. Like, I, I mean, one of his favorite YouTubers is Mr. Beast. Oh, yeah. And the amount of time that Mr. Beast has spent to really become a master at having videos go viral is ridiculous but the kids don't see that they see the end product they see 20 million views on his video and that he gave away you know f- you know 500 turkeys for thanksgiving and he gave away a chocolate factory and this i'm like what well, do you know how he gets that money yeah he gets it from youtube but he worked his butt off to become very great at what he does and then he's created a non-profit so he still has a philanthropic arm to what he does and he likes giving away his money mm-hmm. but he likes taking care of people at the end of the day and I, I see, I mean, I see a lot of correlations from from the lens of, of a father, and I see it in TV shows all the time. Mm-hmm. And it's you know, it's it's part of the reason I started this podcast and I talked to Vince about it. With I'm just an old school comic book nerd, so I think back to the days of you know Superman and when he was when he first landed on Earth, and he wanted some knowledge, and his father had encapsulated all of their their culture's knowledge in crystals. And he went back every time he needed advice for that. Yeah. It's one thing I wanted to do with this podcast is encapsulate that knowledge, not only my knowledge, but other dads' knowledge on everything and anything. Like, I am itching so bad to have a dad who's a musician on that shares my musical love because I, I hear songs and I think about people. Yeah. That when I was around them and, and how that made me feel, and even hearing a song that I was around no one, how it makes me feel. Like it's it's beautiful. Yeah, it's nostalgic. Beautiful. It's nostalgic. And it it touched and I, I've shared that with my son. I mean, his first concert was the Foo Fighters. Awesome. And to share my love of the Foo Fighters with him live, uh, you know, was great. It was fantastic. And he got to hear his favorite song and how it was, you know, how it was music was meant to be heard and heard live. And it's great. You get that interaction and it's, you know, some people were like, oh, were you, were you afraid that he would, he would contract COVID? And I was like, no, I was afraid that he'd get a contact high or, <laughs> or that he'd start saying the F word all the time because Dave Grohl says the F word a lot. 
Yeah. I was like, so I was more concerned about that than the actual him contracting the virus. It's like, but it was the experience. Mm -hmm. And in that experience, you know, there's a lot of things. And I know he'll remember that back, you know, in his day. And I still remember the times with, with my dad. And I had a fantastic father growing up. And it, it was weird. Our our relationship switched a little bit when I became a father. Yeah. And he he was more like an absent father than that and an yeah. absent grandfather. And it was this weird correlation and trying to to work through that as an adult who had a great relationship with his father growing up but now as a father himself no longer had that relationship with his dad and it was it was it took some time to you know wade through that water and work through it but you know now we have a a a good relationship again we've worked through that and it's just I cats remember in the cradle song yeah it's a cat's in the cradle song yeah, like, cat right? like, song yeah so it's really thinking about Hey, how do we go back to that? How would you go go back to what I grew up with, and how do I relate that with my son? And it's really, really what this whole podcast is about. Just like right. your podcast is about. Hey, let's t- let's have these t- tough conversations. Let's yeah. talk about it. Let's do it. And it's get you know, into the guts of things, right? Yeah, like, it gets into the guts of things. And we were talking about memories before the the this, the podcast, and it was you talked about growing up doing pageants as a little boy. <laughs> Because we were having makeup put on because they're too damn shiny. Yeah. So it's it's those memories last for us. And that's that's what we go back and think about. And I, I shared with you, I was just like, oh, I can't wait for my son's wedding. There's going to be so many things <laughs> that I show. Or, you know, thank God there wasn't affordable videotapes and cameras back in the day when I grew up. Oh, uh, yeah. That's uh, that's where we really dodged a bullet. Yeah, right? we, have the, than... we have the iPhone now. And uh-huh. I, can, I got tons of memories <laughs> on that bad boy that are going to come out during his wedding or before the wedding. And he's not going to know like my favorite one still to this day is we were at a restaurant in Little Rock, Arkansas, where we lived that. Okay. And he was eating a taco and he loved, and he was watching, I forget the name of it now, uh, the Aquanauts. Okay. And so he was really into pirates and and their terms. And he takes the taco up to his eye and he goes, Ahoy, Captain Daddy. <laughs> and I'm like, forever I will think about that. And I have the video to, to watch. Yeah. And, and it's great. I can pull back on those memories when I didn't close a deal or a deal fell apart. Or, you know, think you're just having a crappy day. Yeah. It's things that as a dad, you can pull back on those great memories and think, oh, okay, I remember that. Like that's yeah, things things are gonna be bad today, but they'll be better tomorrow. Yeah. No, it's fantastic to be there. You know, I mean, that's what it's all about. That's what I didn't get married until I was like 40 years old. Um, I guess maybe 41. I don't know. But that, through that entire time of trading, I was just chained to a desk, essentially. And I was eating trashy food, gaining weight. I think I weighed like 250 pounds. Uh, by the time I finally just kind of broke off the desk and got out and started you know, working out, eating right, doing yoga, and just kind of getting my life back together. And I really started to get grounded myself and started thinking about, like, where am I? And what do I want out of my life? It's probably halfway over, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I just thought, man, I want to be a dad, you know, because there's just nothing, there's nothing better than to be able to pass that knowledge on, you know, to the next generation. So, so tell me about that. You're you're in a unique situation, and it's great that I have you on. I found this out about you. So you're also a stepdad, right? And a, a lot of times, men are thrust into that stepdad position. And again, just like being a regular father, it can go either way, yeah, good or bad. Tell me about your experience with that, and and what helped with you diving into that. That you know has made you a great stepdad as well as a great father. Well, I think it's just because I'm very childish. <laughs> you know, I'm just a kid at heart, right? Like, so I say that all the time. It's been great having a son because I just get to do all the crap that I loved as a kid. And I get to do all the stuff that I didn't get to do as a kid because we didn't have money. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, it's kind of like a, being a kid round two, right? Like, yeah. we, we never actually grow up, right? Like, I don't want to grow up. We're all Toys R Us kids, right? Even though that place is bankrupt and gone, but. Yeah, they came back. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, they, they went bankrupt. Stores. Yeah, so they do. Oh, okay. So uh, <laughs> when my son or my stepson, he was two, he had all these medical issues basically. And we spent night after night of him throwing up and going to the doctor and all these things. And it turns out one night we found out after going to the hospital and going to another hospital because they couldn't treat him because he's such a 
so young, right, that he had an obstructed ureter and he is having kidney failure. Ooh. So one of his kidneys is failing. And really, like, um, we told his real dad about that. I was like, Randy, you have to tell his dad what's going on. We're taking him to the emergency room, right? And this is like at four in the morning. And he didn't show up until like 16 hours, 18 hours later, you know? And I was just like, man. And every time there was a procedure that needed to be done, um, you know, he he disappeared. And I'm sitting there like holding the kid down so they can stick things down his penis hole, you know, or whatever it was, you know, like in order to figure out what's going yeah, on. In order or to do the ultrasound, you know, and it freaked him out, you know, and I'm, I'm there holding him down and being the one for, there for him, you know, so... It was very meaningful to me uh, to be there for him, and it it really kind of built the bond between us, right? So um, I don't know. It's just made being a dad just that much uh, more rewarding. So um, yeah, and now I get to do it with my biological kids, right? So and they're still a part of it. And they're basically uh, mentors to uh, my bio- like biological children, right? Even when they go away to go to their dads for the weekend or uh, during the summer or where, whenever it is, like, everybody's missing them, you know, and they're just part of the crew. So, I sure. mean, that's really, that's really kind of how it all came together is we're making no, and, and lemonade shared, out of lemons. Right? Yeah, and you shared before the podcast, too, that your your stepson's father is, is a good dad, isn't involved, but... I think it was just a, that certain situation at the beginning that kind of scared him, and it scares a lot of people. Yeah, uh, but it, you don't know how to handle it, and so, you know, thankfully, your son had you to to step up and be there. Yeah, I think that that happens, like you said, that kind of thrust you in the situation of yeah. this kid has no other choice but you, for you to be there. Uh, but we're we're coming up on time. I always love to end the podcast with if there's one thing that you want your kids to know, uh, what is it? Uh. That I love them, you know. I think that's it. I think it's just that simple. That I love them and things will never be so bad that, you know, things just don't ever get that bad. You know, there's always going to be tomorrow. You always live to fight another day. And, you know, you always have your community and the people that uh, love you around you. And as long as you focus on that community and your family and the people that love you, then, you know, anything's possible. No, that's the perfect way to end. Uh, it's it's a, a great piece to leave our kids with is, you know, know that you're loved, know that it's not that bad, lean on the people around you. And if you lean on the people around you, you'll see a little bit of piece of your dad in there and you know most everybody. So, hey, thanks for joining. I appreciate it. I can't wait to be on you, your podcast as well. It's yeah. going to be fun. Uh, and everybody tune in next time and subscribe, like all that good social media stuff. Uh, so we get this podcast kicking and rolling, rocking and rolling. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks for joining Rad Dad Podcast, everyone. Please like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next episode.